Power of his resurrection, that power given me the ability to overcome hard circumstances as I've pursued knowing Jesus. And he talks about those circumstances in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We looked at it. He says, I want to know that resurrection power that brought Jesus from death to life because that is what guaranteed for us that we would be in eternity with the living God. Amen? And then he went on to say, and I want to know, I want to share in his sufferings. I want to be a partner in the very sufferings of Jesus. I don't want to live my life safe for Jesus. And he knew that the best way to get to know Jesus is to share your faith and to suffer on behalf of Jesus. And then he went on to say, I want to become like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And then he talks reality, reality that I believe we all need when we look at our Christian lives and what they are like and where we are spiritually and where we need to grow. Paul says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained this. Or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Paul has this incredible spiritual self-perception. And when you are listening to a believer who is all about the knowledge they have, the things they've accomplished in the church or in the world for their own benefit that they thought they were doing for God, when they talk more about themselves than Jesus Christ, you have this great sense that they have not arrived. And yet, my guess is that they are communicating like they have arrived. When you walk with Jesus... It's a walk of daily surrender, submission, and obedience. It's simply a walk of pursuing him and following him. And Paul says, 30 years into his faith, planting churches, seeing multitudes coming to know Jesus, giving his life for that very pursuit, you would think that he would be one who is like a super apostle that would look at his life and say, you know what, I've gotten to that place where I don't really need to grow anymore. With all of his training that he had, even as a Jew, he looked at his life and said, you know what, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect. Paul communicating to these young believers probably 11 years into their faith, many of them who would have been saved when he came out of that prison in Philippi said, listen, you got to have a real perspective of your life. When people listen to you about your faith in Jesus, what do they hear? He's not talking about a false sense of humility. Hey, listen, I still have a ways to grow. He's talking about a reality that when he looks out on the horizon, he says, you know what? I got a long way to go before I actually look like Jesus. 
I still have many other things that God has to do in my life to transform me and change me and grow me in obedience. I want to know him. I want to know him. And we find even in the ranks of the Christian world and the church world, people who are all about the positions that they hold, the credentials that they bear, the accomplishments that they have achieved, their Bible knowledge. And you know what? What does that have to do with actually knowing Jesus? The people you want to walk with, the people you want to be with, the people you want to rub up against, the people you want iron to sharpen iron for you to be sharpened with are those who have an accurate self-perception of their spiritual life and their relationship with Jesus, an incredible humility and a recognition that I have not arrived, I have a long way to go. He says, I press on. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. That word is apprehend. It's like Paul is saying, there was a moment on the Damascus Road, I was going for a very different purpose, and in that moment, I was struck blind by the glory of Christ, and he grabbed hold of me and apprehended me and changed my very life. And Paul said, I have to press on because he said, because Christ Jesus has made me my, his own. He gave Paul not only salvation, but incredible purpose. And so there was a moment in time. For those of you that know Jesus. Where Jesus swept into your life, struck your heart brought you to the recognition that you need a personal relationship with him. Some of you grew into that because you were raised under the truth of God and in the environment of a believing home. But there was a moment where Christ Jesus apprehended your life. He took control of your life and he said, listen, I'm saving you, not for you but for me, and I'm not only saving you, but I am giving you incredible purpose. Paul said in Acts 20, 24, he said, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I would finish this race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus gave me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace, Paul knew that not only did Jesus move into his life, grab hold of his life, take control of his life, call him to surrender his life, but he gave him incredible purpose. Do you believe that about yourself? I mean, is your very reason for being with Jesus simply salvation, and then from that point on, you go on and you do whatever you want? There's a very purpose for why Christ saved all of you and me. And he took hold of you, and at times he's still wrestling to take hold of you and I, and he's saying, listen, Paul said, I have not obtained that perfection. I'm not there, I haven't arrived, but this is what I'm going to do. I press on, and that word for press on has energy and exertion and determination behind it. He's not passively saying, listen, I got a long way to go. Sometimes I think we approach the Christian life that way as though we passively walk in it. And occasionally when we're convicted, we may exert a little more energy to know Jesus. But Paul said, I press on with determination to make this whole reality of what Christ has done for me my very own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Do you hear those words? Christ Jesus made you his own. 
You are his possession. You are a part of his family. He took hold of you and he said, I want control of your life. I want you to serve me. I want you to be about me. I want you to get to know me. I am making you my very own. I took you out of the world and out of darkness and freed you from sin and death so that you don't have to be lost. You don't have to question your identity. You have an absolute understanding of who you are. And when he makes you his own, he has given you an incredibly secure spiritual life. Amen? He said, but there's one thing that I do. That's it. This is my determination. Forgetting what lies behind. And I love the way that is expressed in the, li- in the Greek, the original language, the things behind forgetting. You see, Paul is drawing on a foot race. He's using athletics to illustrate with this whole idea of the Christian life is to be about. And the forgetting is to have no remembrance of something in the past. And the word for behind points to the part of the race that was already run. It's human for all of us to look to our past and hold on to things that will either cause bitterness or deep hurt or wounds or just some type of pain and to look back and to look back and to look back and to grab the hold of the past and try to bring it into the future or the present and somehow believe that you can move forward by holding on to something. And in reality, Paul isn't just talking about the negative experiences in our life. He's talking about all of those perceived accomplishments from the past that we hold on to so that we have a healthy healthy self-view. He looks at the past, he says, man, you can look back and say, here's the great things I did in my life, or here's my accomplishments, and have this sense of pride, because when you look at where your life is today, you may feel lousy about your life. So you look back, back then, back then, back then, and my past defines who I am today. And in reality, Paul says, why are we doing that? He said, we're in a foot race. And a runner who glances back, even for a moment, runs the risk of either tripping, stumbling, or losing focus and being taken out of the foot race. What I love is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where Paul says we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. The old is done away with, the new has come. This stuff happened in your lives 10, 20, 30 years ago for some of you. There's stuff that you've been carrying Forward and you've allowed it to infect your soul and bring you down and keep you feeling low and depressed and anxious. There's stuff that has happened that you're still trying to process and you're trying to bring it forward with you. And there's even probably statements about you that define who you think you are. And there's experiences that you had that you can't let go of. And what Paul is actually saying is, you know what? If you're going to move forward in your life, if you're going to grow the spiritual maturity, if you're going to stay in the race, if you're not going to get tripped up, it's time to leave the past 
in the past and stay focused on the present and allow the Holy Spirit to bring comfort and peace in your heart. You know what? Paul did look backwards. But when Paul talked about his past, like in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, all the things that happened to him, it was so that the glory of God would be evident, the power of God would be uh, seen, and the grace of God would be clearly displayed. He didn't talk about the past simply as a negative experience that affected him today. He said, you know what? God's grace is sufficient when he talked about The thorn in the flesh that came into his life, he said the very reason why God did that is so that I wouldn't get prideful. Because if I get prideful, I would never say I've never gotten there. I have not obtained it yet. I haven't arrived. When you're prideful, you have an unhealthy view of yourself and others, and you get stuck in the Christian race. And Paul said, listen, God gave me this thorn in the flesh and allowed it to take hold of my life and remain in my life so that I would not get prideful. But he also told me my grace is sufficient. And so you look back and he says, you got to forget the things that lie behind. That part of the race has already been run. You can't rerun it as much as you would love a do-over you can't rerun it forgetting what lies behind all the turns the uphill climb the rocky roads the smooth services surfaces all those experiences good and bad If you just simply hold on to them, they will weigh you down, trip you up. And there's a reason why many Christians falter in their Christian life because they're always glancing behind them. And I want to say this very clearly, church. Even churches need to forget what lies behind and press on. Even churches and groups of believers need to forget what lies behind, not overlook it, not ignore it, not act like it never happened, but see the power, the grace, and the majesty of God who brought us through all of that. And as you walk forward in your life, what gives you the ability to be determined, to be passionate, is your desire to know Christ deeper through everything that you have gone through and allow him to maintain control of your life. He apprehended your life. He took hold of your life for purpose and he clearly knew the circumstances of your life and the race that he set before you. He said forgetting what lies behind and straining straining forward to what lies ahead and that word for straining is to exert oneself stretched out it's like the visual picture of a runner who is reaching out towards the finish line and they're reaching and they're stretching and they're exerting they want to finish well so bad that they are not just sort of walking through the race and and whatever happens happens but they are stretching they see the goal they know what the prize is they have a sense of what they are about paul said i consider my life worth nothing to me if only i may finish the race and complete the task God gave me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace, what motivated him, what energized him, what caused him to stretch out with everything he had and and pursue it with energy and determination as he wanted people to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. That is what God asked him to do. 
that is what he was going to do to the day that he was called home. You got to forget. You got to strain forward with energy, stretching yourself out. Lord, listen, I don't know how long I have here, but I'm going to stretch out. I'm going to pursue you with determination and energy. I'm going to exert. I can't look back. Those things have shaped me. They define me, but I'm not going to allow them to change who I am in a negative way. I'm going to look to see how your glory and your grace worked on that. And then he says in verse 14, I press on. I press on. If there's words that you may need to hear today, as you may be holding on to something, it's press on. Press on. Your past hurts. Don't have to define your present and your future. They'll only do that if you try to drag them with you. The writer of Hebrews said it a little bit different. He said, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith Paul said listen I got to forget that stuff he could harp on his accomplishments on the mission field the churches he planted the persecution he faced he said all that was for a moment, I've run that part of the race that's behind me now. I have the rest of the race to run. I got to keep my eyes forward because if I glance back for a moment, I will get tripped up. I will lose energy. I will lose focus and I probably will quit. So we live in a culture where Christians are fading all the time, right? Not just leaving church, they're leaving their faith. They're not running. So he says, I got to press on. Toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I love the, what the word prize means. It's an award for exceptional performance, both moral and spiritual. The prize that is the object of and can only be obtained in connection with the upward call. Paul says, you know what, what all this is about? This whole Christian life, this relationship with Jesus it's about moving in a forward direction, growing deeper, loving him more, uh, making him known to those around me. And I'm pressing towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, you know what? I see the goal. I see the prize. I know what that is. Well done, good and faithful servant. It's that ability to look back at your life when you stand before Christ and know that you did everything you could to serve him and you never got tripped up by looking back at the parts of the race that were difficult, but you always had your eyes focused forward. Not living in denial, but allowing God to show you how he wanted to use those past moments in the race to keep you going, building endurance so that ultimately the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus would be yours. So he said this, let those of us who are mature think this way and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Let those of you who think that you are mature 
if you've been walking with Christ for a while, if you're serving in his ministries, if you're one of his leaders, Paul is saying, you know what the attitude is that you should have and that you should display? You know what your life has to be like? One of a learner who is humble, who is obedient, and who recognizes that I have not arrived. So when people rub up against me, I'm not talking about my Bible knowledge. I'm not talking about the great ways I think I serve the Lord. I'm not talking about my accomplishments and my own pursuits and my greatness in the world around me. I'm talking about Jesus and how much more I need to know him. I'm honest about my sins and failures, and that's difficult in the context of a church that may not be a safe place. I'm free to share. And when I'm burdened and looking backwards, I allow God and his people to help me process so I can move forward. Paul said, let those of you who are mature do those things. So if you do in your one-year Bible reading, you probably are in somewhere around the book of Exodus. And I was thinking about this as I was reading the experience of Exodus that the Israelites are the best example for us of what not to do in a race. The Israelites are good examples because when things get tough, rather than trust God and keep pressing forward towards the promised land, they look back and idealize the past. It hindered them from reaching what would have been the best for them, looking back and holding on to a skewed view of the past, which affected their attitudes, their view of God, their resistance of leadership, and their behavior. They became demanding and discontent in every way. All they kept saying once they crossed the Red Sea was, it was better back there. It was better back there. But that part of the race, if they were real and they were honest and they had an accurate self-perception, they were in slavery and bondage to the Egyptians and it got tougher and tougher as the plagues increased. And yet for them, they idealized that. That's got to be a lot better than where I'm going. Well, I can assure you that if you're a believer in Jesus, where you are going is a lot better than where you've come from. Amen? That one day we're going to get to stand before him. And you could call it the promised land. They call it heaven. We'll be in eternity. But it's going to require determination and exertion. And not looking back, we got to press on. And where it's difficult to process the past, you allow the Holy Spirit and God's people to help you to do that so that maybe you can see God in the past. Paul started with, worship team, you could come as we prepare for communion. Rao Shom, how much he should suffer for the sake of my name. That's what Ananias was told about Paul when he got saved on the Damascus Road. Paul went on to say after that, 23 years later, he wrote these words, but I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish a course in the ministry that I received when Christ apprehended me. 
the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and the parts of the race that I've already run, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is an incredible example. The Israelites, a negative example. They quit the race from the beginning. It seemed like it was too hard, but yet to get to the promised land, to get to heaven, you have to run the whole race, right? Or at least to get there with the well done, good and faithful servant, you got to run the whole race. Paul concluded after he wrote those words to the Philippian church with these words to his spiritual son, I fought the good fight. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. I fought the good fight. Are you fighting the good fight? Are you so determined to know Christ, to stay in the race? Are you exerting energy? Are you doing everything you can to stretch out and reach the prize that everything else around you is just a part of the race, but it's not the ultimate for your life. So your work, your family, all that stuff, what you want to do is you're stretching out to reach the ultimate goal of that Christ is going to give you and that well done, good and faithful servant. I've fought the good fight, I finished the race. So Joji was sharing yesterday at our equip meeting about somebody who I think is above all things, mightier than all, at least in his spiritual race. the one who had led Harvey Cedars Bible Conference for years, and even as Joji was sharing, it almost makes you feel guilty and convicted of how much impact this man had had and the influence he had and the way he ran the race. He could say, you know what, I finished the race. I finished it. And there's going to come a moment where you're going to finish the race. But Paul went on to say, I kept the faith. From meeting Jesus on the Damascus Road, to his whole journey of the race, to the end when he was called, he kept the faith. And that's not easy. And yet that is what the Christian life is really about. And so Paul made it clear. There's one thing he does. Forgetting what lies behind. Stretching to what is ahead. He presses on. Amen. Lord, I pray that even as we prepare for communion, that you would move in our hearts to bring incredible peace and hope 
and the fresh reminder of what you have done for us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Bill, if you want to come forward. For me, there's nothing sweeter and more uh, meaningful than to spend time around the communion table because Jesus instructed his disciples to do this very thing. And I believe the only time we look back in the race in a healthy way is to remind ourselves of Christ's all-sufficient sacrifice on the cross. That as we look back and remember, that's what Jesus said, remember. As we look back and remember, it's memorialized that part that began our journey with Christ and started us on the race. Take those moments with honest self-perception. And we invite the Holy Spirit in to help us have an accurate look at our souls. If Christ returned now and your race was finished, what would he say? You stopped fighting the good fight? You lost faith? You got tripped up because you were looking back? In the moment that Christ saved us, we were made new, new creatures. The old has passed away, the new has come. And so Jesus said, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, in that very night where he was going to the cross, he took the bread, he broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. And you may come today not knowing Jesus. You may come today not even sure what your relationship with Jesus is like, but when you look at the bread, it's a reminder that Christ's broken body on the cross was for you. It is that personal. It was for you. And he went on to say, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So in the race that you're running, a part of it is proclaiming, proclaiming Christ has come. Christ has died for you. Christ has done an incredible work to be the all-sufficient sacrifice all you have to do is surrender, and in surrender, spending the rest of your life pursuing him and fulfilling his very purpose for your life. He didn't die solely to save you. He died to save you so that your sins can be properly paid for, and in that, he gave you
very point in the day, acted, or you can come forward with, we know many of you love doing, you're welcome to come down front and Bill and I love serving you. Bow your head, take some time before the Lord, and when you're ready, come forward. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art, thou my best thought, by day. King or sleeping, thy presence, my life. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Be thou my shield and my sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity. Be thou my.
relationship with Jesus. And though the race may be hard at times, we press on knowing what ultimately we gain through Jesus Christ. That we can look back But we also know that if you take your eyes off Jesus, even for a moment, you can get tripped up. You can lose focus. You can get discouraged. Because when you take your eyes off Jesus, all you see is the journey you came from. Paul said, you know what? I fought the good fight. As he ran, he fought it, his way through it. He kept the faith. That's huge. He kept the faith. So when he stood before Jesus, it was that I kept the faith. I finished what you asked me to do. Race is hard. But the glory of Christ is at the end of it. And so really, we look back at the cross. That's it. And when you look back at the tough road that lies behind you, look for the goodness of God. Just look for the goodness of God, even through the hard stuff and the painful stuff. If you haven't taken it, you can join me as I take it. I want you to stand with me as we sing this last song. And while the team is singing it and we're singing it with them, if there's any of you who are in those rocky parts and the difficult parts of the race that just want to come forward for prayer, I would invite you to do that. Joji, if you'd come down front for our ladies and Jane as well. Pastor Doug. Ray. Vonda, come with him. We have Lisa, a big part of our prayer team. We're just here. We're just a family. So if you're troubled, if you're having difficulty, Come for prayer. We would love to do that. Worship team, if you would close us, and then I'll come back up to pray. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love, destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned. Or suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority, every victory.
Sending a sound, light in this broken land. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority.
but I want you to listen. There are very real times. There are times where you may feel stuck in the past. The hurts are deep, painful, and have really, really affected your life. And when you have trouble healing from the past, that's when you need help whether it's our pastoral team or a professional counselor or a life coach, it's, it's okay. But that's where you share that and say, I feel stuck. I feel bitter, I'm struggling, I need help. But even in that, by God's grace, when you walk with Jesus, you experience incredible freedom from the brokenness. And you never forget that Christ has come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So we press on. We press on. Exerting our energy with determination to fulfill the very reason why Christ apprehended each of us. He saved you with purpose. Keep going. Don't lose heart. Press on. Amen. As you leave today, on the just outside the door on the right is a sign up for our gather event this Friday. You know, I close with that honestly because it's just the end of the week, sitting together, being together, processing life together. There's a simple activity that night, but it's not meant to drain you. It's meant to energize you and bless you with great relationships. So we would love for you to be there. But we need to know you're coming. Father, when you chose to save us. You chose to forgive everything that we did in our past. Every sin is accounted for through the blood of Christ. Nothing is left undone. And you give us the ability in that moment of salvation to walk freely and experience the power of your grace and love and the depths of your mercy and so father i pray that you'd bring in this moment incredible healing to those people who have been damaged by past hurts who are holding on to them feeling stuck feeling too hurt to forgive father would you meet them right there and free them so that they can run with you. I love, Father, what your servant Eric Little said years ago. When I run, I feel the pleasure of God. So that as we run this foot race, Lord, with our eyes fixed on the ultimate goal and the ultimate prize, may we experience the pleasure of God through every turn, over every bumpy road, and every smooth surface, we praise you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great rest of the day.